That's it. We'll have five minutes for questions. Oh, yeah. yeah, there's the recording that just started. So people online missed the introduction, but that's OK. So uh, without further ado, let's go to our first lightning talk. Joseph, take it away. Cool. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I thought Yuri wanted to go first, and he's saying in the chat that he's ready. Yuri, do you want me to leave you go first? If that's possible, sure. Please go ahead. Okay, well, my name is Yuri, and I'm about to start sharing my entire screen and show what I have accomplished. Can you guys see the screen? Is the screen visible? To me, yes. I hope so. Yes, okay. it is. Excellent. All right. But Yuri, um, we can't hear you very well. Um, you're very muffled. The mic is seems better. Wrong. Yes. This is better. Excellent. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. So as I presented before, um, some of the things that I have been working on, and Max will continue my uh, my presentation with our mutual pro uh, project. I have been mostly working on graphs and maps. Graphs. Uh, there is a graphics extension that's now capable of showing map, simple maps and various visualizations of the data for everyone to see. I uh, presented as a as a in wiki defined format. Some of the interesting work the community has already been doing and that's actually I think much better to present what community has been able to accomplish rather than what I personally did uh, to, uh, to help with that. So, uh, for example, on German Wiki, uh, I believe the guy's name is Miss M I S, uh, created this template which allows a very simplistic charts, simple, uh, simple, uh, one dimension. Oh, sorry, two dimensional uh, bar and area chart um, can be done with a very simple template and just sp supplying some parameters. Uh, this has just been released. Also, another very interesting one is a simple map template, also very simplistic uh, interface, much simpler than Vega itself. Um, if you look at uh, a, wiki page, a Wikipedia page, for example, timeline of Moscow Metro, uh, the, this chart visualizes how each line grew in time. So as the number of as the years progress, the number of lines increase, and which line grew. Another use, a very convenient uh, graphing uh, visualization is list of most expensive paintings. There's a big list of exp uh, of uh, the most well known paintings, and there's a scatter plot that def that shows the the most well known uh, the, mo the the most well known uh, paintings when they were sold. Oh, sorry. When when they were made and when what artists there by, so you can uh, you can see, get much more information from the data. Fun. Uh, uh, sorry. Um. So uh, there has been a lot of usages. English Wikipedia is actually lagging behind, but something like Hungarian Wiki, uh, for example, has th uh, tens tens of thousands of usages of the graphing and some of them you can see it's basically a little bar chart showing the population history taken from wiki data um so as, as you can see there and actually the data is from all over the place and uh, uh from different uh, different places around the world um that's basically concludes my presentation about graphs, and I would actually let Max continue with the maps. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Yuri. And um, uh, Max will present a little bit later. He's not mic'd yet and ready. So um, I will open it up to questions. So if you have a question, come here, ask it at the mic or uh, put it on IRC. And by the way, I love this idea of editing wikis to create a graph. 
it's uh, super powerful. Thank you. entity that it's on its own um, you see any possibility for integrating the two um, either using this uh, graphs thing for our search dashboards or maybe using it in addition to search dashboards for like for wiki reports maybe something to generate after the fact done analysis something like that. well graphs tie fairly closely with the uh, media wiki software and um, it can take data from any source, obviously, but, and external source including, uh, included, but it's at the end of the day, uh, th this specific technology was developed as a on-site, on media, uh, inside the wiki page uh, component. Uh, we could adopt it, uh, we can do, do very creative things with portals, for example, uh, Zero Portal was actually created on using Wiki technology and some Lua scripting, so that could also happen this way. Um, uh, as a, it, it all depends on the technology of the dashboard as we develop it. Uh, if if it's part of the Wiki, then I see no problems absolutely to integrate it. A question from IRC. Um... Uh, can data used to generate the graph uh, be taken from another table, for instance? Absolutely. Um, the, the, if it's currently, it's possible to use any other page on the same wiki and use Lua scripting to extract the data from that page, convert it, filter it, format it, and submit it to the graph for plotting. Uh, which means that uh, that table, for example, that I showed of the most expensive paintings, in reality, it would be ideal if that table was stored as a data blob, uh, as a like a, something like a CSV file, uh, a CSV text on the wiki page, and uh, Lua would generate the, both the table and the graph from that data. Uh, eventually, I hope that the data can be stored on commons as files. And then this way, uh, it can show, for example, uh, United States as states maps with the highlighting of individual states or regions or things like that. Uh, or also the data, uh, like expensive paintings, again, uh, stored as big blobs of data uh, parsed by Lua and visualized into something more useful. Right. Thank you very much, Yuri. So let's give a round of applause for Yuri. So next up is Joseph. So Joseph, talk to us about PayPeas. Hey, uh, so I will start sharing my screen. Hopefully you can hear me. And now, cool, great. And can you see the the slide I have now? No. Hmm. Then it's bad. I will not use the presentation style. I will use this. Maybe I need to switch off my camera. Mm. Share, share screen. Oh, it says loading. It's good. Ah, oh, great. I'll I'll try that way then. Works. Yeah, it looks good. Cool. So, talking about page views, uh, a project from the analytics team. I'm Joseph Alemandou. I've joined the, the Wikimedia Foundation a few months ago, uh, in February to be precise. And uh, page views is one of the core uh, things I've been focusing on since arriving. 
So the idea is that we have a lot of HTTP eats at the foundation. Uh, last uh, 18th of June, I counted 9 billion HTTP eats on one day. So, and those were only the ones I knew about because I'm pretty sure that uh, some of them might not be in our logs. And uh, the idea here is to try to make this data more useful. So the researchers came with a definition for what they call a page view, which is basically a request for Wikimedia assets that can be counted as a single human-driven request for self-contained piece of text-based content. Mm. What that means for me is we want unsampled data with no spiders or uh, as few spiders as we can because some, uh, some automatic uh, bots do not describe themselves as spiders and they are very difficult to track. We want no actions except the actions that are actually content presenting like search. And we want to enhance this data with some uh, useful additional information. The way we do that is we take all the hits we get on our front-end infrastructure into log lines. We log everything into our computing system called Hadoop. And that represents about 1.6 terabytes per day. So that's big. After that, in order to have this data more easy to work with, we refine it and we pre-aggregate it in order to get to a point where this data is uh, at a size where we can use it on a daily basis, about 6.5 gigabytes per day for the aggregated page views and even smaller if we, want, uh, if we don't want too many dimensions like the project views with about 4 megabytes per day. This data is for now available for internal staff or researchers under NDA, but our project is to make it available to the, the broad community through an API. Obviously, it will be sanitized before, and we will make sure that we cover all the intellectual property uh, uh, before releasing the data. Now, it does work, and I will also make a little demo with you you being uh, uh, an internet interface to query the cluster. So basically here, there is a queries for the page views for the top 10 countries of desktop users on EN Wiki. It was the same day I did uh, the data for, which is uh, the 18th of June. And using the same query for the refined requests we took about 14 hours of cpu time so since we have many machines running in parallel um, it's not 14 hours of real waiting but it's still uh, very much computation Talking, taking the first aggregate we used we go back to 16 minutes of cpu time and using the most aggregated uh, data set we have it takes about three minutes we gain uh, about a thousand uh, a certain time. Quick demo, as I said. Let's go to you. This is an example of query done to the cluster, where I basically get the continents and the page views per continent for the full month of May for users only on English Wikipedia. And this is what we get, basically. We have 4 trillion page views for North America, 2 trillion for Europe, 1.7 trillion for Asia. The chart is not very beautiful because U is not perfect. It's not really a charting tool, but it gives you an idea of what we get. Another example would be this one, which is the top 50 pages over the month of May. Some funny thing you can get here is that you know that there was a new Avengers getting out, that there was some boxing going on, some Game of Thrones, obviously, etc. And this 
uh, in reasonable computation time. I'll get back to the presentation. So now the work in progress on that. We want to integrate this data into a dashboard, the vital sign dashboard, to make sure that uh, having page views uh, regularly updated can uh, can be viewed by uh, by as many people as possible. Then we will deliver two cubes-oriented data for uh, for researchers to work with, and then the plan is, to, uh, as I said before, to build an API for the broad community to be able to request its data in uh, and make our page views accessible to people. And I guess that's me. Do you have any questions? Great. Thanks, Joseph. Any questions? Silence. OK, we'll keep it moving. Thank you very much. And um, if you have questions later, you can always ask Joseph offline. Or if you want to know more about that this. screen. If you also want to know more about this, you can ask to turn this into a tech talk. Um, same goes to any talk about today. Right, so let's move on. Our next presenter is Stas, and he's going to talk to us about the Wiki Data Query Service. Yeah. Um, guys, there are some questions in RC that are just filtering in for uh, Joseph. I think we maybe should talk about those first. Okay. okay. Just very quickly, so, I see the, meantime, what's the difference yeah. between hue and vital science? So hue is an interface into Hadoop. It lets you write type queries and also lets you visualize the data. Um, so it's for a very technical person. Vital science is meant for a high level report card of um, metrics, like pre computed metrics. Hope that serves. Yeah, we had another question about uh, page view API timeline. Oh, so the timeline we're going to build an API this quarter, and it will be a, a very simple API like stats.grok.se. Um, so that's as much as I want to say about the timeline for now. And uh, saw another question about um, uh, are they both publicly usable sites. No, so he is not public the, the because it gives you access to the raw logs demo. and refined logs. There's information there that is not public. Yes. So that's a, a tool to be used internally okay. by data analysts uh, I'll, I'll the type. and researchers. Probably. All right, I'll okay, so leave it sure there so we can now? move on. Stas is not ready. Okay. 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 Are we ready? All right. Next up is Tas. Stas. Okay. So uh, I'm. Uh, yeah. Okay. Is it? Hello. So okay. So I'm Stas Malishev. I'll be talking about uh, the Wikidata query service. So let's start with why we need this thing and what uh, the thing is. So, so we have about uh, uh, 14 million uh, data uh, data items in Wikidata, and that's just items. We probably have uh, billions links about them. Uh, so the question is how we make uh, sense of all of it, and more importantly, how we let people that use it make a sense uh, of, of it. So basically that's that's the purpose of Wikidata query service or more kind of formally is this is the way to ask uh, complex questions uh, about the data and uh, get uh, these questions answered. So uh, example questions. So suppose we are interested in life and work of famous physicist uh, Richard Feynman and we want to, to know who he was working with and uh, uh, what uh, these people were doing at the time that uh, he was uh, working with them. So how we ask uh, these questions. We are not there yet to just put it in the some text field and have it answered, but we have a kind of uh, next the best thing. We have a, a language or 
there is a language called Sparkle that enables you to ask uh, questions about the data. And the Wikidata Query Service uses uh, this language and the software that is uh, uh, built to understand this language to ask the questions about the data. So uh, the questions that we talked about look something like this, basically. It's not exactly how it looks 100%. We'll see that uh, later, but it's uh, roughly the, the form that you ask questions. So there is a formal language that you put uh, kind of uh, the data you want to, to know, and you get uh, some answers like this. So it worked with, he worked with Kyle Sagan in Cornell University, and Kyle Sagan is astrobiologist, and he worked with uh, Robert Oppenheimer, who is a theoretical physicist. So that's uh, basically how it looks like. So let's see now how it looks like in reality, what we have. So I'll need the, yeah, I'll need the Chrome here. Yeah, okay. So can, can I? So that easier just, yeah. So uh, that's the uh, site that we have now, the beta version of the of the project, and it's uh, public. Everybody can go there and write queries. So we have an example query that lists uh, presidents of the uh, United States and their spouses. So if we run this query, we get a list of answers that uh, we can all recognize that that's indeed the list of presidents and uh, the, their spouses. And we have another thing that we have built so there is a, a thing called Explorer. So if we want to know who was Jane Wyman, we can uh, go and see, for example, what was her occupations. Yeah, it's a bit jumpy. So uh, she was an actor. And then uh, we want to see, for example, uh, what awards she received. So she received the Academy Award for Best Actor. So we want to go there and see, OK, maybe who else received this award? Oh, so that's a lot of people. So we, we can we can explore like who, who was Liza Manelli. So we can we can learn about Liza Manelli too. But I am not going to go too far into this because that that would get really busy on the screen. But I hope you get the the idea. So basically, we can ask the query and then go and explore the data that we we have uh, learned from this query. So, okay, so can we go back to the slides? Yeah, so I, I want now to, to switch to the, oh, just the switch here. Uh, I need the, Okay, so yeah, so what's uh, what we want to to do with the thing? Uh, like uh, all, all this is nice, but uh, we want to integrate it basically in the bigger picture. And one example is like, for example, we search on uh, uh, Wikipedia and somebody asks the list of uh, United States presidents. So what we do, we type there a list of United States presidents, and we get this number of pages, and that's what we have now. But what if we could just go to uh, something like that and show the actual list of the U.S. presidents without having the page? That's kind of one of the things that we are thinking about doing. There are many more, and uh, we welcome uh, suggestions about this. So that's that's what we have about the data query service, which is brought by Discovery Team. So. If uh, anybody has a question, to answer them now. <laughs> That's really cool. Um, were you, the, uh, uh, are you using the straight up Sparkle uh, libraries for the querying and also for the visualization? Sort of cool stuff. Are those libraries? Did you write all that stuff yourself? yourself? So, so we are not using any 
libraries to 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 do Sparkle right now. We basically just to kind of write a Sparkle and uh, send it to the engine and uh, get back the data and display it. So there is one uh, project that I know of uh, uh, that uh, uh, for PHP library to to make kind of more convenient to to use Sparkle, which would be very useful uh, when we start uh, kind of doing queries from like Wikimedia stuff. But uh, right now it's it's just kind of you just write X basically just the same way you use SQL and send it to the server and get get back like JSON data or any other way of structured data. And the visualization, cool stuff, the animated blobs and everything. What was that? So, it, it's uh, yeah, it's on with JS, so it's uh, basically a very simple uh, uh, with, with visualization on top of with JS. We just uh, take the data from from Sparkle and kind of display it in a in a graph using uh, with JS. And uh, we we plan to to improve that and kind of make it uh, more pretty and less jumpy and kind of more friendly to the user. But uh, right now, that's that's uh, kind of a simple thing. All right. No questions on IRC. All right. Okay. Let's hear it, Stas. Thank you. <laughs> Next up will be Dan. Um, he will talk to us about the sheet key. Hey guys, um, starting to share my screen now. Let me know if it works. Good. Yes, we see it. Okay, cool. So the sheet key is a little dashboarding system that we built um, last year as a proof of concept to put up vital signs, which are kind of standardized metrics. And we kind of put it in freeze after that and got to pick it up again recently. And we want to show up some, some progress. So the idea, the name is dashboards configured on wikis, dashiki. And you know, dashikis are colorful clothing, so fits. Um, so what you want to do is make a dashboard. And what you're going to need is an idea of how you want to lay out the visualizations that, that you're trying to uh, kind of put on the dashboard. So a dashboard compared to a visualization serves the purpose of kind of telling a story around a particular set of data or area of, of data. And it it um, tries to combine like sort, sort of you want you want to look at um, a lot of data in a simple way. Um, and a layout will solve that for you. Uh, you want to be able to update the configuration, add graphs, remove graphs, whatever it may be. And um, you're going to need a web server to serve it on. So a layout um, is something that pe a lot of people don't think about. And, and what you end up if you don't think what you end up with if you don't think about it is these endlessly scrolling pages, um, sort of just put graphs on top of each other and keep going. And at some point you go, that's too many graphs. No one can see any of them. Um, so that's why we, we recommend talking to a designer. That's a good idea. Uh, but if you do that, you come up with um, hopefully something that's useful. This example is a comparison layout between visual editor data and wiki text data. This was needed to kind of think about the launch of visual editor and the progress. Um, and you can see here a couple of different types of graphs. This is hosted. At, I can I'll paste the link in the chat later. Um, but it's one one example, and this is another. Um, this is we have 852 projects, uh, and we have a bunch of standard metrics. So uh, showing those all is tricky. Um, we put a couple of autocompletes and, and things around it and made it look pretty, and it, it's much more palatable. So that's what we mean by layout. So if you if you think of a layout and then you come up with some uh, visualizations for it, you combine all that, all that in uh, into little components. We build using knockout components, and I'm happy to talk about that. I'm, this is kind of uh, I'm more interested in kind of what you guys think about this and where we can go from here. 
but yeah the uh, configuration that you need for this particular dashboard is very simple so you'll see that by default we have these eight uh, wikipedias that are showing up and the daily page views metric and if you go in here you'll see the default projects default metrics and the metrics that are available um, overall to select from so that's all the config that you need and as you can see it's just a wiki page on meta uh, it doesn't even have a nice extension it, it probably should have a, an extension that registers the config namespace but haven't gotten to that and dashiki lets you build the, the end result that you serve from a web server just by doing this so you just go gulp specify the layout specify the config um, and it packages the it minimizes and, and concatenates the javascript and the css and everything and puts it in a folder that you can then just easily serve with a simple uh, virtual host or you can take the resulting files and serve them on a wiki um, or anywhere because the shiki doesn't have a server it does everything over um, over gets and it it assumes cores and everything is set up. So we went around and did that to all of the places we host static files around our um, environment. So datasets.wikimedia.org is an example. A couple of labs, places where we host stuff all have cores. So yeah, um, this, this lets you create dashboards. Um, they look like this uh, or like whatever you want. Um, so it really, it's up to you. Um, as you can see, you can have custom visualizers, um, anything that uh, anything that JavaScript has to offer, you can easily package in a tight little uh, knockout web component and build a dashboard with it. So going forward from here, what we really want to do is kind of make this easy for people to add to. Um, Mm -hmm. easy for people to stand up on their own and wrap it around their data. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I just want to open it up and kind of ask what you guys think about it. Um, if we're missing anything from kind of the vision and how we built it, or if you want to know any more details about code or anything like that. Let's, there's some questions on IRC. Uh, is there some good documentation for the Shiki so people can play with it? Uh, e, uh, no, not really. Um, we just kind of, so it was on cold for a while and we just kind of executed on the sort of vision that we had when we first started it. Uh, so there's no documentation yet. Um, but mostly I'm not really sure kind of how people are thinking about this, if it's interesting to anyone. So I'm not really sure what angle to get to make the documentation from whether it be user, like focus more on the user perspective or on the contributor perspective, et cetera. Another uh, question from IRC, uh, is Vital Signs the next generation of flow dash report card on WMF labs? Is it hard to upgrade such report cards? Yeah, flow dot report card, I can click on it in the IRC here um, and show people. So this is, this is gonna suffer from kind of that endless scrolling thing where you just have graphs on top of graphs. So like, let's say we were to migrate this, basically what we'd want is um, give us a better layout, give us kind of parameters that you're looking at. So perhaps um, it looks like we have different types of actions or uh, things that maybe these could all be in the same graph, uh, but just people selecting and deselecting different things. So kind of give us an idea of what that looks like. Maybe work with a designer and then we can quickly throw up a layout. So Dashiki makes it really, really easy to throw up a layout around that uh, that design, and then we can migrate it. Yeah. So that that is the idea of it is to get away from managing multiple different visualization uh, and, and dashboarding tools uh, to just one. And Dashiki is like a dashboard building tool. Yeah. So one last yeah, question. Last question. Echo. So. Um, when would I use the Shiki and when would I use the graph extension? So the graph extension you would use to, so um, 
tight integration with wikis. Uh, right now, Dashiki doesn't build dashboards that are particularly friendly to wikis. You could you could host it on a wiki, but it won't um, it won't like spit the files out in the way that an extension would expect them, like in the same folder structure, uh, stuff like that. Um, but mostly, I think you'd use Dashiki when you want. To have a pretty consistent layout, like you have a, a couple of dimensions, like projects and metrics, for example, that have a lot of large cardinality. Like you have a thousand projects, and you want to show all of them, um, but and you so you want navigation around your data. That that's when you would use the Shiki, I think, um, because if you think about a graph made with a graph extension, let's say you wanted an instance of it for each uh, wiki that we have, it would be kind of hard. Right, cool. Thanks, cool. Dan. Thanks, Dan. Give Dan a hand. So up next is Matt. Uh, Max with Max. All right, so we at the uh, Discovery team at Wikimedia want people to discover more stuff on Wikipedia, more information, more articles to read, more articles to contribute to. So in addition to links in text, uh, we want uh, people to discover stuff based on geography. So for example, if we need, uh, if, we, if we know uh, coordinates of some stuff, it should, it should be perfectly reasonable for people to look up what's around. So we want people to be able to do this. See on map what's, around, discover more information, go to that page, read it. So basically this is a, a dynamic map, uh, like Google Maps, but with open data from OpenStreetMap and uh, the map that's specifically tailored for our requirements. So here we can see London. Unfortunately, the server I'm showing sure this on is slightly overloaded. But yeah, you get the idea. Uh, another thing uh, that we uh, will be working on shortly, as soon as we get the actual dynamic maps is to replace uh, these location images so like people create them manually or with some scripts and then just upload them to Wikipedia, which is um, a serious waste of time and uh, we want to be able to create these uh, images uh, dynamically and uh, when people click on them they will also see uh, dynamic map with all those articles from Wikipedia, maybe data from Wikidata, whatever. So that's it. Questions? Do you have a timeline on when you would replace the maps on the articles? Uh, we will deploy something into production within next quarter. And uh, uh, within this time frame, we will start integrating with Wikipedia. Of course, a lot of stuff depends on communities. 
here because uh, we don't want to force them to use something particular. We want to offer them something superior that they will want to switch to. So it will still be up to the community to update articles to use this, right? Yes. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Let's give a hand to Max. And our last presentation for the day, James. It'll just take a sec to set up the slides. Are we good? Sweet. Uh, so first of all, um, please pardon the crudity of these slides. I sort of slapped them together at the last minute, um, not realizing that I would show them today. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, types and JavaScript, uh, manifested as TypeScript in this case. Um, I recently uh, had to write some JavaScript for one of our uh, one of our tasks, and uh, I realized that JavaScript can actually be kind of hard to keep track of everything in my head. It's too small, but uh, I decided to use TypeScript as sort of the crutch, and that led to sort of an interesting uh, discussion on the value of types and whether or not TypeScript uh, can be useful to us. So this is not to argue that uh, we should move from one language to another. Um, this is mostly just an interesting uh, exploration of uh, sort of some new ideas. Uh, so the agenda of this thing, and this presentation is probably way too long for five minutes, so I'm going to kind of fly through it, but I want to talk about some of the uh, advantages of TypeScript uh, and sort of types in general. So, oh, yeah, sorry. So what is TypeScript? Uh, TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript that's made, uh, developed by Microsoft, and it it gives you everything JavaScript gives you in uh, as well as type annotations, so you can make statically typed uh, function declarations, statically typed uh, variables, and so forth. Uh, and we'll see a bunch of it uh, in the next slide, uh, in the next few slides, actually. Uh, and so actually, that question leads me into my next point. Uh, it's something new. It's something to learn. So of course, there's an overhead to invest in learning a new language. So uh, I hope to show that it might be worth uh, at least exploring that investment. My clicker is not working. It was a second ago. Uh, yeah, it's on. Well, can you just advance for me? Uh, 
go ahead and pass this. I don't think, in the interest of time, I think we'll skip a couple of slides. Awesome. Okay, so here's sort of a thought experiment. What does this function do? This is JavaScript. Uh, the function is named foo, and it has one argument, x, and I've hidden the implementation. And to save you the time, uh, I'll go ahead and tell you that there is uh, absolutely nothing that you can infer from uh, this uh, function signature uh, in terms of uh, guessing what this function might do. It looks like it's a unary function, right? It looks like it takes one argument and maybe does something with that. But because of the way JavaScript works, it could ignore that argument. It could, uh, it could use other arguments that aren't even listed there by using the arguments object. Um, it could mutate some state. It could do nothing. It could return void. It could uh, assume x is a number and double it and return that. Basically, we know absolutely nothing about this function. So uh, for us to understand what it means, we are essentially required to go into its implementation and read the source code. Uh, so this is the same function, but now it's uh, I've added a, a type annotation, uh, and this is TypeScript syntax. So what this says is that uh, foo is a function that for all a, where a is any arbitrary type, uh, foo takes one argument that's an a, and it returns an a. And so it doesn't look like we've really added anything, but actually this thing is, is pretty darn profound. Uh, so if you think about what would it mean to define a function that takes uh, uh, something of any type where we don't know what the type is, we just know it has some type uh, represented by the variable a, and it returns a thing of that same type. Uh, well, it turns out there's actually only a single possible implementation uh, of this function, uh, and that's the identity function. Um, can you press right? It's not working on my clicker. Uh, there we go. Uh, so I guess these don't work too well with the clicker, but that's cool. So here's uh, the implementation revealed. And for this thing to compile, and there's a little caveat if we ignore null and undefined, the only possible way for this thing to compile is to just return x. Um, and, and I'll get into kind of some reasons for that um, in a minute. But I think this example, uh, you could walk away from this presentation right now having seen only this example and get 90% of the point that I'm trying to make. Um, here's another example, and I'm going to go much more in depth in it. So let's say we encounter this code. We see var z equals multiply six and seven. Um, because the function is called multiply, we can assume that it's going to take those two arguments and multiply them together. So most likely, uh, it, it, it would be reasonable to assume that z is going to be two. <sighs> um, do you mind if I just use the keyboard? This thing doesn't play too well with the slides. Awesome. Thank you. Yes, OK, much better. OK, so I'm going to give you a whole bunch of possible implementations for multiply. So here's the obvious one. Multiply takes x and y and multiplies them and returns that value. So in that case, it does what we expected it to do. But we could also implement it this way. Uh, we could return the sum of x and y, and that would be perfectly valid JavaScript, right? Uh, it could do nothing. It could re uh, multiply these two values, but maybe we forgot to type return, and so it, it actually returns undefined. And we wouldn't really know this until runtime, and maybe not even then. Uh, it could ignore one of the arguments. It could return something entirely different from the arguments, and so in this case, it's not even returning a number, which we thought it should. Oh man, I'm way almost out of time. <laughs> Um, I'm going to really fly through the rest of this. OK, so and on and on and on. Uh, so it can do all these things that aren't what we think it should be able to do. So uh, we just flip this on its head and run away screen, right? Uh, well, what if we uh, throw in some uh, types here? Uh, which I, yeah, so uh, let's say that we have a strongly typed function multiply. Uh, and we write it this way. Uh, so now what is z? If we assume that multiply takes two integers, sorry, takes two numbers and returns a number, uh, let's see how that affects these uh, functions from the previous slide. So our first function is not really changed. Second function is also still valid, even though it returns kind of the wrong thing. Uh, this function will not compile. Uh, if we try to write this function in TypeScript, the compiler will say, hey, you told me multiply returns a number. This doesn't return a number. Something's wrong. Uh, and so now we've caught one of our problems at compile time before we deployed this thing or ran our tests. Uh, this is still valid and incorrect. 
the uh, string return has the same problem. Uh, our type annotation says this returns number. We can't return a string. Um, and so the compiler catches that one for us. Uh, and on and on. Sorry, in the interest of time, I, I have to rush. Okay, so this is a little better. We've eliminated some potential uh, error cases from the code that we could uh, be released into code review. Uh, and this is way too in-depth for me to go into. Uh, sorry. Um, but uh, it, this is similar to that, uh, that first example where we had the type parameter and it made things really awesome. Uh, so maybe talk to me after and I'll explain why this is cool. Uh, so I've shown very briefly that there are some advantages. We can annotate our functions with types, and that prevents a certain subset of errors from uh, from entering our code. Uh, but there's a catch. Uh, this is TypeScript. It's not JavaScript. So a browser doesn't know how to run TypeScript. We have to produce JavaScript from the compiler. So that's an extra overhead. Uh, also, it's something that we might not um, the the generated JavaScript might not be something we want to deal with. Uh, we want to deal with the TypeScript source. So uh, what happens when we compile this code in particular? Uh, and fortunately, uh, because TypeScript is a superset of JavaScript, uh, when you compile it, unlike with CoffeeScript or some of these other languages, uh, PureScript, the output from TypeScript tends to look almost the same as the TypeScript itself, just throw away the type annotations. Uh, so it's actually not too much of an overhead, I think, uh, when it comes to reading the JavaScript that's generated from TypeScript. Okay, and so that's the end. Uh, so the, the conclusion that I totally don't have on these slides is uh, this is um, maybe worth uh, using, if nothing else, is just a tool to help write the initial JavaScript, even if you then throw away the TypeScript and put the JavaScript version control. Uh, that's at least how I intend to use it for my first project. Um, and then maybe we'll keep the TypeScript around, uh, or maybe not. Question? Is this basically strong typing for JavaScript? Yes, this is strong typing for JavaScript. Uh, uh, well, I, I, maybe that's a little bit too simple. Uh, JavaScript does have strong typing, but this is static type for JavaScript. So this is uh, declaring and dealing with the types of things uh, when we write the code rather than uh, when we run the code. Um, I have a question. So what was the project that led you to consider this, or, or what was the problem you were trying to solve? Yeah, the problem that I was trying to solve was adding uh, event logging to the Wikipedia portal, www.wikipedia.org. And so that meant I had to write a whole bunch of JavaScript to, uh, to go through all of the links and all of the form elements in that page and then instrument them with event logging code. So there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of manipulation of things. Uh, and I had to know, is this a link? Is this a form? And how do I manipulate it differently um, because of that? Uh, so it wasn't a problem that specifically was geared toward having types. It just happened to be a JavaScript problem. Uh, and so any sufficiently complex JavaScript problem is uh, too hard for me to understand. So uh, I found that TypeScript was uh, pretty helpful. Thank you. Any other questions? No? OK. Thanks. Let's hear it for James. So that will conclude our talk. Thank you very much for attending. And uh, the, we'll send out an email once it's posted to YouTube. All right. Thank you.